Uh, my, my sermon today uh, is uh, going to be from Mark chapter 1. We're going to spend the next couple weeks uh, really just working our way through Mark chapter 1. Uh, I told you last week, uh, or two weeks ago, sorry, that uh, this season that we're in, kind of in the, just after Christmas, is all about trying to discover who is Jesus, right? The, the, what Jesus is being revealed to the world. What does that mean? And as he slowly kind of reveals who he is to his disciples and, and to the people around him, we're going to kind of go on that journey with them. Okay, we're going to go on that journey with them through the early uh, verses of Mark chapter, uh, or through the early uh, chapters of, of Mark. So we're going to pick up today in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 20. This is, how, this is what Mark says. Now after John, this is John the Baptist, was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and they followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending the nets. Immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and they followed Jesus. This week, I was uh, you know, scrolling through Instagram, as one does, and I was, uh, I, I was caught by a, a post that uh, ESPN had on their Instagram feed. It was a, it was a series of pictures of uh, professional athletes in their middle school ages. It was a series of, of pictures of, of some of the best athletes in the world and what they looked like at the ages of... 10, 11, 12, 13. And it's always kind of fun to, you know, look at the, the peak, you know, human physique back when they were 11. They were braces-wearing, acne-ridden, somewhat pudgy children. It made me ask the question, what is it about posts like this that kind of draw us in, right? I didn't keep scrolling. I stopped, and I looked at each one of the pictures that ESPN had posted. What was it that was so compelling about this post of these athletes? It's a couple things, I think. On the one hand, uh, it, it's always fun to go, oh, wow, I looked like that as a middle school kid. If only I had tried harder, maybe I could have been a professional athlete. And then I remember that I'm like five foot seven, and the NBA was not calling my name. I am no Muggsy Bogues. On the one hand, it's, it's, it's fun to go, oh, wow, I looked like that as a kid. These people, they're not that different than I was. Right? It's so easy for us to say, wow, it must have, they must have been so different than us. And, and don't get me wrong, sometimes it is. Right? We can hear stories of Shaquille O'Neal talking about how hard it was for his mom to buy him shoes as a child because his feet are like that long. Some of us, you know... Shaquille was destined, right? But to some extent, we go, wow, they're they're not that different than I was. And that's where I think the other compelling part of this post is. It it makes us go, wow, they were nobody. You would look at this person and go, man, in 20 years, you'll be on the cover of a Wheaties box or whatever. Right? They, They were nobodies back then. It's just their... 12th grade, or, you know, 12-year-old picture with mom. And there's something about that. It's kind of cool for us to see what people were like before they were somebody. Before they were who we regard them as today. What I like about our passage today in in Mark chapter 1 is that we get a a sense of that about four people who go on to to absolutely change the world. Our our passage today picks up with four kind of nobodies. Simon, Andrew, James, John. These, These people go on to become absolutely influential in the history of the world. Right? Every professional athlete in America could only hope to have the kind of impact on the world that these four people had. 
They go on to preach the gospel and baptize thousands of people. They lead churches in all over the world. These people go on to become absolute somebodies. But when Jesus calls them, they are nobodies. See, it's actually kind of interesting. Most rabbis, uh, you know, rabbi is just a, a word that means teacher. Uh, most rabbis, they would have gone down to Jerusalem to find their students, their pupils. They maybe would have gone over to Caesarea Maritima, the, 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 the center of the Roman, in, uh, uh, um, the Roman Empire in the region. They would have gone down perhaps even further to Alexandria, Egypt. They would have gone to get the best and the brightest students. They would have gone and they would have said, Hey, tell me who you think is going to be somebody. Who is going to be the person who influences the world? They would have gone and they would have looked for the hopeful somebodies. Jesus goes to the backwoods that he was raised in. Galilee was known for being kind of the country bumpkin region of Palestine. Jesus goes to the Sea of Galilee and he finds four people who are not students. They're not scholars. They're not experts in the law. We're not even sure they can read and write. They're fishermen. And they're not the kind of wealthy fishermen who get to sit on the shore while other people do their work for them. Right? We find them in the middle of their job. Right? Jesus effectively walks into the gap, finds four store associates, and says, follow me. And they're like, okay, let's go. Right? Maybe, I, you know, we think these guys might just be teenagers. I was a teenager. Maybe they're like, I get to stop fishing? Let's go. Maybe they're excited. I don't know. But they're not anybody. They're, they're not special at the moment. And I have to wonder what Zebedee feels like. Like, wait a minute. <laughs> you just took two of my workers, dude. <sighs> now I got to hire new people, right? Now I got to hire people to replace my kids. I had kids, so I didn't have to pay workers. But this is who Jesus calls. He says, come follow me, and I will teach you how to fish for people. Follow me. And what's so beautiful to me is that these guys are like, cool, drop the nets and let's go. They follow Jesus. And it leads me asking the question, what does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean? Right? Mark tells us this story not just because it happened, but because he wants us to learn something from it. And so what can we learn from this passage about what does it mean to follow, right? That's, I, I, I kind of pour over my Bible going, what does it mean to follow you, Jesus? What does that mean? What are these guys doing? I've said before that I think that we need to pay attention, pay extra attention to the first words of Jesus in the Gospels. Each gospel presents Jesus uh, just a little bit differently, uh, meaning they, they give us different details of his life. They give us different episodes. And I think that the first words out of Jesus' mouth in each gospel tell us something about how that writer understood Jesus. Because believe it or not, there are different words in each gospel, which is kind of beautiful. Here in Mark... The very first words of Jesus are the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe in the good news. Mark 1, 15. Repent and believe, for the kingdom of God has come near, the time is fulfilled. It's interesting to me, a couple weeks ago I preached a little bit on repentance, last week Todd preaches a sermon on repentance, and here we have repentance showing back up. I didn't really, that wasn't planned. There's something I guess we need to learn here. Maybe I need to learn about what repentance has for me today. We've talked, though, that repentance is more than just saying I'm sorry, right? It, it's not repentance to say I'm sorry I did that. That's not repentance, the, the biblical idea of repentance is to say, I was looking this direction, I repent, and now I'm going this direction. 
I have changed my mind fully. I have, I have made a conversion. I have changed my understanding. And, and, and here's why I, I, I bring this up. Mark is the shortest gospel, 16 chapters long, and it moves so fast. You can, you can, you can read the gospel of Mark in less than an hour. It doesn't take very long. And in fact, you could tell the whole story of Mark around a campfire in probably under two hours if you were reading it out loud. It's the shortest. And so what that tells me is that when Mark gives us details, we should pay attention to those details. And here in this section, we have a, a couple important details about these four guys. If I were to ask you to say, if, if, if I were to introduce myself for the first time and I say, who are you? There are probably a couple different things that you might say about yourself. Give me your name, probably. But then like most people, we start to say things like, here's my job. Here's my geography, where I'm from. And then here's my genes. Here's my family. Our jobs, our geography, and our genes are often how we identify ourselves. That is how we describe who we are. I am Adam. I am a minister. I live in Madison, Wisconsin. I grew up in Kenosha. I was born in Decatur, Illinois. I lived in New Hampshire. And my family is, you know, my wife and my kids and my mom and my dad and my brothers. And we often will identify ourselves those ways. And here's what's incredible to me about the, the reason I bring this up is that these four guys, Simon, Andrew, James, and John, leave all three of those behind. They leave all three of them behind. Jesus says, follow me, and they drop their job. They go, I'm no longer a fisherman. No more cleaning nets for me. They're going to leave their geography, right? They're going to follow Jesus all over the world. They're, they're going to go all over the world. They're going to die in places hundreds of miles from where they were born. Their, their story starts in the backwoods lake of the Sea of Galilee. Peter's going to die in the center of the empire. John is going to die in exile in the middle of the you know, Mediterranean, basically. James will go on to you know, become a big leader in the, Palestinian, the church in Israel. Palestine area. Some people think Andrew went as far as Persia. They leave their geography. I'm no longer a Galilean. And then really incredibly, they leave their family. They, I, I think it's important that Mark tells us that Zebedee's in the boat with his kids. And they hop out of the boat and go, Dad, I'm following that guy. I'm going with him. And now here's what's kind of incredible about that, right? So, so later on in chapter 3 of Mark, uh, Jesus is at a house, and he's, he's teaching and performing some miracles. And, and some people come up to him, and they go, hey, your mom and your, your family's outside. And then he says, who are my mother and my brothers? Looking at those who sat around him, Jesus said, this is my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Jesus redefines family. He says, if you, if you are with me, you're my brother and my sister and my mother. Like, this is my family. This is what the, the disciples leave their biological family and they join this kind of new, odd family. A family that's going to wander around. A family that's going to spread the good news. We're no longer fishing for fish, we're fishing for people. This is our family, right? When Jesus dies on the cross, he looks at his best friend John and he says, Hey, my mom is now your mom. Take care of her. I've got, I've got a new family for us. You see, these guys, they, they leave their jobs, their geography, and their genes behind. Following Jesus, this is a big ask. This is a big invitation that Jesus extends to these guys. And they leave it all. 
One commentator uh, who, who, who I read uh, on, on this section says that the great apocalyptic moment in Mark is the kingdom of God versus the old world order. Now, that's big fancy words because commentators, they want to make you feel like you're getting your worth out of their books, right? What he's describing, what he means is the message of Mark, the, the call to discipleship in Mark is going to call us out of our former status quo. What was the status quo of the world, of, of, of the people around us who are not followers? The status quo is not our status quo. Our status quo is different. It's not about climbing a ladder. It's not about having the, the most, you know, I'm the best, I'm the, rep, I'm, I'm the coolest, I'm the, I have the best job. My family name is this, respect me. The status quo for the kingdom of God is different. And this is good news. Make no mistake, this is good news. At the end of our Bible in Revelation, there's this moment where the, the, the new heaven and earth are, are coming into being and, and this holy city of Jerusalem is being lowered onto the earth and, and, and the voice from heaven comes out and God says, behold, I'm making all things new for the old has passed away and the new has come. The kingdom of God is fully on earth and what that means is that there's no more death and no more crying, no more pain, no more suffering. Instead, there's nothing but life and peace and love, that, the, that God will dwell fully with us, right? See, the reason that we, we, we shun the old status quo is because we know that it's broken. Why are we seeing a, a, a rise in teenagers who are dealing with anxiety and depression? Because that old status quo is really pervasive. And it says, if you don't look this way or talk this way or dress this way, you are a failure, if you don't have this job, you know, we got 15-year-olds making millions of dollars online somehow. And I talk to kids, and they go, man, I'm a failure. It's like, no, you're not. That's weird. I mean, good for that kid. I'm not, I'm not anti that. But, but we're called to a different message of success and status quo. Our status quo is not defined the way that the world around us defines the status quo. Jesus says, come follow me, and I'll make you fishers of people. Because the kingdom of God is near. Not it's coming, not it's out there, not we hope at some point. He says it's coming because the time is fulfilled. Whoa. That's what he said. But you know what's really impressive to me? <clears throat> we, see, I, I know all of that. I believe all of that because I have the rest of my Bible that I can read. I have 2,000 years of history since Jesus was here that I can look at. I, I, I've got the benefit of, of, my, of my current situation, right? I can look backwards and go, wow, that's really cool. And this is what we're hoping for and whatnot. These guys, what I think is so cool about these people, these nobodies, is that they don't even really know Jesus yet. They don't understand who, like, like okay, so we got this guy who was baptized down the Jordan River, and then he, he's gone for 40 days. He shows up, he's preaching this kind of weird gospel, and he tells me to leave my dad in the boat and follow him. Cool, I'm in. <laughs> like, parents, let's be real for a moment. Your kid is a, let's say they're a senior in college. They come home from spring break and they go, yeah, I'm dropping out of college because this guy came and told me to follow him. That, Zebedee is going, I, what, where have I gone wrong? Right? Zebedee's got to be going, I, finish at least the work day, follow him tomorrow. They don't know who Jesus is yet. I told you, in, in Mark's gospel, the, 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 in, the, the picture that we have here, they haven't really even heard Jesus preach yet. He hasn't performed a single miracle yet. And they follow him. And here's why I think that's important. They don't know what they don't know 
They don't know what God is going to reveal to them. They don't know all they're going to eventually know. And yet God calls them anyway. God calls them as nobodies. Jesus is fully prepared to do the on-the-job training. Right? This is an internship with hopes of a full-time job. Come, come follow me. I'll teach you how to do this. You're going to be different. Well, beard pop, sorry. I'll stand. They, they don't know Jesus yet. And, and let me say this too. Boy, are they going to mess up. Boy, are they going to miss it. Peter's a good example of this. We have, unfortunately for Peter, we have more evidence of his mess ups than any other disciple, right? Let's think about this. I, you know, at the transfiguration, we're going to read this passage in a couple weeks, but at the transfiguration, uh, somehow Elijah and Moses appear on this mountain and, and Peter goes, let's turn this into a temple. Let's all live here. This is the new, pl- this is the new temple. Let's turn this into a shrine. And Jesus goes, no, no, no. You, you've forgotten that the, the call is to follow me, not stay here. This is just a moment. Peter's the one who tells Jesus, no, you're not going to die. He literally gets called Satan by Jesus. At the, in, in, in chapter you know, 14 of Mark, we'll see this around Easter. Peter says, I don't know that guy. Don't, 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 don't arrest me. I don't know him. I know I sound like him. We've got the same dialect, same accent, but I am, I am not the Peter that followed him. No, no, no. You got me mixed up with somebody else. When Jesus dies on the cross, we're told that there are all these people who were there and the people who aren't listed are interesting. Peter is nowhere to be found as Jesus dies on the cross. I I bring that up to say they don't get it right all the time. They didn't know who Jesus was. He calls them anyway. They mess up and Jesus routinely offers grace to them. And he calls them to be different. Earlier today, we read a story from Jonah. Jonah chapter 3. Jonah has been tasked with going to these people who are the enemies of Israel. In fact, Jonah is going to the very people who will eventually fully destroy the northern kingdom. Jonah does not want them to be saved. Jonah does not want them to be forgiven. Jonah is angry that God even wants them to consider being forgiven. So Jonah runs away. Big fish swallows him, spits him out on the land and says, no, 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 go that way. So he does. Jonah goes into Nineveh. He goes into the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And what is the message that God has given him to preach? Repent or destruction is coming. He does not send Jonah in and say, hey, read the book of Deuteronomy. When you're done with that, pick up the history of Israel. When you're done with that, he doesn't give them the full story of God. He doesn't say, go in and tell them how I created the world. He doesn't say, go in and tell them how I called Abraham out of Ur. He doesn't say, go in and recite to him all of my deeds in the wilderness. He says, go in and tell them to repent. He does. They do. And God says, I forgive you. The people of Nineveh, some of the, I mean, most atrocious people in the world, by all accounts, they were allowed to follow Jesus without fully understanding it. They were allowed to to follow God without fully understanding what that would entail. You see, nobody is perfect when God calls. One of my favorite scenes or, you know, uh, arcs in NBC's The Office is in an episode where they're trying to get Dwight to do something, and he's angry because they're not doing things the right way, and so Pam says, well, Poe Buddy's nerfed. And I love the scene because Dwight goes, did you just have a stroke? And she says, no, 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 it's a joke. 
Like nobody's perfect, I can't even say these words right. Nobody's perfect when God calls. Thanks be to God that the grace of Jesus is enough that he will call a bunch of nobodies like us and say, I can make you somebody. My somebody's going to be a different definition than the world's going to define somebody, but I will make you into somebody. You don't have to be perfect. I'm going to call you out of your imperfection. I will teach you on the job how to follow me. Thanks be to God, that is the Savior that we follow. Anybody who tells you that you have to be perfect to follow God is lying to you. If that's what you're telling yourself, that's Satan trying to keep you off track. Well, I'm not good enough to follow Jesus. I need to figure this part out before I follow Jesus. I need to get this done. I need to get that done. I need to X, Y, Z. God says, no, no, no. That's not how I act. Come follow me. Come follow me. If you want to talk more about following Jesus, what that means for you, please come find me after church. I want to talk with you about that. We'll set up a meeting. I'll grab coffee. I'll buy you coffee or tea or whatever. Buy donuts if you, you know, maybe donuts better. Anyway, I'd love to talk to you about what it means to follow Jesus. Because it's my deepest belief that Jesus is calling each one of us to follow him. That Jesus looks at you in whatever boat you're in and says, leave that where it is and come follow me. I love you. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for Jesus who comes to us, who seeks us and calls us out of where we are and into a new life. Thank you, God, that the, the old world, the, the status quo that we currently live in, as oppressive as it is, is not what we need to be worried about, for it is passing away. God, thank you so much for calling us to follow you. May we have the courage to leave our nets and follow you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.